today we are looking at the draft voluntary assisted dying bill to be tabled in New South Wales Parliament by independent Sydney MP Alex Greenwich, hopefully before the end of the year. We are joined today by Shane Hickson, who is Vice President and Spokesperson for Dying with Dignity New South Wales, an advocacy organisation who have been fighting for a number of years now to see VAD passed in New South Wales. Shane, thank you for your time today. You're welcome, Suzanne. Of course, Queensland has now passed VAD legislation by a significant margin, leaving New South Wales pretty much isolated. It's the last attempt in New South Wales was voted down by just one vote. Now, independent Sydney MP Alex Greenwich has said that he will table the draft bill in New South Wales Parliament at the first available opportunity after Parliament resumes from COVID shutdown. At this stage, I understand that's October 12. And he's saying he still hopes to do so before Christmas. So given that scenario, hopefully before Christmas could mean a number of things. Are you seeing any dates bandied about about when it may actually get on the parliamentary agenda? Is there any tentative dates being floated around it? Well, originally Alex had hoped to introduce his bill in mid-August, but as we all know, COVID situation in Sydney meant that Parliament hasn't didn't sit in August and they didn't sit in September, but they are expected to return, as you said, on the 12th of October. So Alex is planning to introduce the bill during uh, private members' time, which is on the Thursday, the 14th. So that's the date that we expect the bill to be introduced. And then the debate will start in the following week, again on a Thursday, when there's private members' uh, time to do that. Terrific. Look, Alex appears to have garnered significant support for the draft. Um, the general political discourse I'm hearing now seems to suggest that there's an increased level of support to what there was last time around, although I guess it's hard to tell till it actually goes to the vote. But do you believe that is the case? And if so, what's changed this time for support to have increased? It's, um, it's, it's, is it simply a case of New South Wales being the last state standing or is there more to it than that? Well, a lot has changed since the last bill lost by just one vote. So we came very close in 2017, but at that stage, no other state had a law, or had passed a law. Uh, within a few weeks of that uh, failure, the Victorian Parliament passed their law. And since then, Western Australia passed a law, which has also already come into effect this year. Uh, Victoria's law has been operating for more than two years now. Uh, this year, Tasmania, South Australia, and most recently, Queensland have all passed their voluntary assisted dying legislation. So that's a huge change to the, um, you know, the, the environment that this debate is going to take place. And also New Zealand and other jurisdictions around the world including Spain, have passed legislation this year during the pandemic. So, um, you know, we, we feel that that does make a difference. We, we were fairly confident with numbers even back in 2017, but unfortunately it was introduced into the upper house first and we, as I said, missed by one vote. So it never reached the lower house, but there was growing uh, support amongst lower house MPs back in 2017. And I think the main reason is because, um, you know, this is, uh, overwhelmingly supported in the community. The polling shows that well over three quarters of the community and quite often over 80% uh, do support voluntary assisted dying laws with strict uh, eligibility criteria and um, safeguards to protect the vulnerable. So terminal illness with less than six months to live unless it's a neurodegenerative disease, in which case it's less than 12 uh, months to live. With uh, The person has to have decision-making capacity. They have to be an adult, uh, two doctors, independent doctors have to assess the person for eligibility. Um, you know, I could go on and on. These, this legislation is highly safeguarded. We know that it works not just from the evidence from overseas, but now we've had over two years of experience in Victoria and uh, the, there's a um, six monthly uh, report that's put out by the Voluntary Assisted Dying Review Board, and that shows that the, these laws are working as anticipated and they do provide a compassionate last resort choice for people who get to the end stage of their illness and find that their suffering uh, and their symptoms can no longer be relieved, even with the best palliative care, and this legislation gives them the choice to choose the time and manner of their death, die peacefully, uh, usually at home and surrounded by their loved ones. 
as it should be. It's difficult, isn't it? Mm. As to be expected, there will no doubt be impassioned debates from both sides when it does reach New South Wales Parliament, probably similar to the heartfelt representations we saw in WA and Queensland most recently, indeed all the other states. So I guess my question to you is, that being the case, what are the objections that have still survived at this point? What, what are the likely things they are going to try and use to block the bill? Well, there's a number of arguments that uh, opponents uh, in all the debates we've seen in Australia, um, you know, they, they put forward. Uh, things like uh, all you need uh, is good palliative care and then there'd be no need for these laws. But even palliative care, Australia themselves uh, admit that, that, you know, they're now neutral. They're not opposed to the legislation anymore. And uh, they acknowledge that there is a significant number of people, a small percentage, somewhere between 4 and 8%, whose symptoms cannot be relieved even with uh, the best of palliative care. So that, that, that argument doesn't really stand up. Uh, some people, there's still the, the old slippery slope argument that once you pass um, a law such as assisted dying, you know, where will it end up? Will people be, uh, you know, have their lives ended without consent, all of that sort of stuff? Absolutely no evidence of that overseas. And it's been operating overseas for decades. Um, and now, you know, obviously, we've got the evidence here in Australia and absolutely no evidence of that at all. Um, you know, but pe people worry about vulnerable people, but there is, uh, there are these laws are, as I said, very narrow. There's, someone has to be dying of a terminal illness to uh, request assisted dying, and they have to maintain decision-making capacity, not just at the beginning of the request process, but right through to the end. And I know of at least one case in Victoria where the pharmacist, who was the last you know, person, I suppose, to... Um, uh, you know, assess the patient when they were going to be handing over the medication, found that the patient no longer had decision-making capacity, so they weren't able to, to leave the medication. And uh, that person did die probably in a similar way to most people supported by palliative care, but they weren't able to access voluntary assisted dying. I mean, sometimes they say that it, it sends the wrong message to society as a whole, that some lives are, are less worthy or, or less important than others. But again, this is not about the judgment of society, of, of people's lives. The, these laws are are only able to be accessed by the dying person. Only the dying person can ask for a voluntary assisted dying, so not a family member and not a doctor. As you know, at the moment, if someone is dying and their suffering becomes unbearable, the sorts of conversations that are had around hastening that person's death are usually um, held in the corridor with whispers between family members, the doctor, nurses, because it is not, there, is not a law, there isn't a law available now to allow uh, uh, doctors and nurses to hasten a person's death. So even though we know that it does take place in some circumstances and always, I would imagine, for compassionate reasons, there's no safeguards, there's no regulations, uh, no protocols. So the, again, we feel, and the reason why these laws have now passed in, in all those other jurisdictions, all five states, is because the evidence shows that they they. They do work, they protect the people, both the patients and the doctors, uh, and they do provide a compassionate end-of-life choice. The other thing to point out is it, it has, it's been proven in all the other places, both globally and in Australia, where it has been approved that it, it doesn't cause one additional death. No. There are people that unfortunately are going to pass away anyway. All it's doing is alleviating the terrible suffering that is basically prolonging the inevitable, isn't it? That's right. That's that's exactly right. It's not. There's not one extra death from voluntary assisted dying. People are just um, shortening that end stage, which quite often is just. It literally is unbearable for some people. And the other benefit is that there are a number of uh, terminally ill people who are faced with unbearable suffering who take their own lives, and usually in violent and dreadful circumstances, and always alone, so they don't implicate family. And that's distressing. You can imagine how traumatic that is for their loved ones, but also for the first responders, which is probably why uh, the paramedics and uh, the police are, are fully behind uh, this law reform. They want to see these laws introduced because they're the ones who have to attend to these, um, these terrible events where people feel they have no other choice but to end their own life in, in horrific circumstances. Indeed.
Shane, you and other key advocates have been working towards having VAD passed in New South Wales, and indeed in many other places, for many years now. I can only imagine the amount of work and volunteer and advocacy hours that yourself and many others have put into it. It'd be a fairly emotional load, though, wouldn't it, too? What's it like being part of something like that? It'd be exhaustive, wouldn't it? Oh, look, it, it is. It's exhausting. It's um, uh, I, uh, That's why I really sincerely hope that uh, New South Wales can get this done uh, before the end of the year um, because it's been, for me, a personal journey of uh, it's just about nine years, coming up to nine years. My mum died of an aggressive brain cancer and basically following that death, I promised myself that I would do everything to change the law so that people in mum's situation aren't uh, forced to endure the end stage. She referred to it as torture, and and it really was. And um, yeah, it's, it's it's there's been ups and downs. Obviously, uh, the first bill that failed was the 2013 bill um, in New South Wales that Kate Fairman introduced. Uh, then there's been a number of other debates that I've um, listened to or been a part of that failed. But uh, luck, fortunately, I've also been uh, involved in a small way in most of the successful ones as well, uh, particularly in Western Australia, but also to a certain extent to the others because we all knew that, you know, we, we do work together, the Dying with Dignities um, around the country because we know that as soon as, well, we knew that when Victor one law, state passed that it wouldn't be too long before all the others would follow. We're a very united sort of country, um, although with COVID, you might, we, maybe that no. sort of, but maybe we're not as united as we thought we were. But anyway, <laughs> we, we do, you know, I, I don't think that the people of New South Wales would tolerate being left behind. You know, we are going to be a, little, a few years behind the other states, but mm -hmm. uh, we need to catch up. Everyone deserves the same end of life choice. And I have to say, the you know, it, I have in the process of just the last few weeks been reading thousands of stories, emails that are sent to MPs from um, people around New South Wales and the number of harrowing stories is just, yeah, that part is, is pretty tough but I, I know how important it is for the MPs to, to realise what is happening out in the community because sometimes they are a little bit distant uh, from what, you know, the reality bit, bit, uh, of what goes on, but uh, in the absence of these laws, there is suffering, but, you know, either because palliative care can't alleviate symptoms or people ending their own lives, and it has a long-term effect on, on family members, and that's what I'm seeing from these emails is that people are, are still holding on to that trauma, you know, years after the person's death. So um, let's mm -hmm. hope that we, we get this law passed and... Um, yeah, advocates like myself can can move on or get back to what we were doing before. If you could possibly remember what that was even after it going on for so many years. <laughs> Look, thanks very much, Shane, for talking to Green Left today and sharing your experience and insights with us. Is there anything else you'd like people to know in relation to this terrific advocacy work that you do? Well, I would just encourage anyone who's uh, listening or watching that they, um, if they want to see this law passed in New South Wales, the one thing that you can do is contact your local state MP and express your support, encourage them to uh, listen to their constituents and, uh, and vote yes to the legislation when it gets to the vote, as I said, hopefully before the end of the year. Shane Higson, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you.